Hello and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism, the show that finds anarchism, non-domination, cooperation, mutual aid in your everyday life. I'm your host, Graham Colbertson. Welcome to the new series on David Graeber's debt. I opened with a couple of preview episodes in the spring of 2023 on Against Economics was the article by Graeber, and then I spoke to the MMT economist Dirk Ince. I highly recommend those. I had a great time doing it. That was also me testing out the format where I uh, explain and analyze a work by Graeber and then talk to an expert about it. By the time you are hearing this episode, I will have been working on this series for more than a year, and I'm hoping that it lasts for about a year. So this is a significant portion of my life's work. The plan is to do one chapter a month, with me explaining what I find most interesting uh, about a chapter of debt, then talking to someone, an activist, an academic, a science fiction writer about that chapter, or maybe just about the book in general, depending on how the planning works out. All right, I started this a year ago. I'm hoping to end it in about a year. Let's do this. Chapter one of debt is called On the Experience of Moral Confusion. One of the reasons why this has taken so long is that writing this series has been incredibly difficult because it turns out that Graeber just did not write in a systematic way. I guess I already knew that, but sitting down to analyze his thoughts made me much more aware of this. I don't actually think it's a bad thing. In fact, in general, I like writing better when it's not systematic. I like the essay form, usually said to be invented by Michel de Montaigne, where the writer follows a chain of thoughts and associations. I think it's much more honest and realistic than a more systematic form of writing. As long as the writer can keep the ideas straight in their head, which I think Graeber definitely could. Then if you're an academic like me coming up afterwards trying to make sense of it for someone else, that makes it pretty hard. Ultimately, I decided that for chapter one, this moral confusion, the key thing that Graeber is doing is dealing with two big types of moral confusion and showing that they are related or maybe even in some way the same thing. The first moral confusion is a big one for any American who has reached a certain level of awareness about the wider world. For decades, centuries, left-wing thinkers have been trying to explain to Americans that America is, in fact, an evil empire. And this, in one sense, is just an incredibly obvious proposition. The U.S. government runs the world, at least more than anyone else can be said to, and they run the world with the most powerful military ever created. U.S. navies cruise all of the oceans. U.S. Air Force bases dot the entire planet. And yet, despite this imperial force, Americans don't tend to think of themselves as running an empire. This is the moral confusion that comes with being an American. As a character puts it in Kim Stanley Robinson's novel Ice Hinge, quote, That 1776 thing is just a story. America runs an empire. For me personally, and I think probably for a lot of leftists my generation, this realization came on September 11th, 2001, or at least in the aftermath of that day. I was a first-year college student at the University of South Carolina in Columbia. I'd only been there for a couple of weeks, and suddenly my country was under attack. And it's obvious to me now, as it would have been obvious to anyone reading, say, Noam Chomsky or Howard Zinn back then, that this was a war. The U.S. military was dictating political and economic policy all over the world, backed by military power, and Al-Qaeda was striking back. This is not to say that I am supportive of the September 11th attacks. I, I hope that's obvious, but perhaps it's worthwhile saying that. Nor do I think Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda had a good ideology, had really something they were fighting for that was valuable. I could not be more against them. But they were fighting a war against an oppressor. And I didn't understand any of that. It just felt like we were being attacked by monstrous savages who hated our freedom for no reason. As a libertarian-leaning middle-class teenager who, I said I wasn't reading Chomsky and Zen, I was reading Ayn Rand and George Will, if you can believe that. It was just so obvious that the U.S., that we were the good guys. We didn't invade other countries. Our military, like that of the British and the Romans before us, was just there to make sure that commerce happened. We, for the benefit of all humanity, were buying and selling stuff. 
like the food that kept people from starving and the medicine that kept people from dying of illnesses. And our military was just there to protect the buying and selling, not to impose our will on other people. So why were they trying to kill us? That was the moral confusion for me. How could we be the bad guys? And the fact that we routinely dropped bombs or fired cruise missiles all over the world in the 90s wasn't proof that we were bad guys. In fact, I was sure that it meant we were the good guys. Graber has an answer in this chapter for why U.S. violence in the name of the U.S. commercial empire always made sense to teenage me, always made me feel like I was one of the good guys. He writes, From this perspective, the crucial factor, and a topic that will be explored at length in these pages, those are the pages of debt, but we can also say they will be explored at length in this podcast series. Okay, back to the graver. Is money's capacity to turn morality into a matter of impersonal arithmetic, and by doing so, to justify things that would otherwise seem outrageous or obscene. The factor of violence, which I have been emphasizing up until now, may appear secondary. The difference between a debt and a mere moral obligation is not the presence or absence of men with weapons who can enforce the obligation by seizing the debtor's possessions or threatening to break his legs. It is simply that a creditor has the means to specify, numerically, exactly how much the debtor owes. However, when one looks a little closer, one discovers that these two elements, the violence and the quantification, are intimately linked. In fact, it's almost impossible to find one without the other. Okay, that's the end of the Graver quote. So, whereas it felt to me, as an American teenager who grew up in the 90s, that the American empire was an economic one, in which the military was secondary, well, that made America not really an empire. But Graeber is arguing that this is a state of moral confusion. The violence wasn't secondary to the economics, nor was the economic growth of the British or Roman empires secondary to their violence. And if you think about how Lisa Eberle and James Cork Webster described the Roman Empire as it didn't really matter what happened as long as the money flowed into the center, and the violence only came when the money stopped flowing into the center, shows you that the money flowing and the violence come together. It's not one and then the other. The money flowing is synonymous with violence, and the violence is done to make the money flow. So that's the first moral confusion. The IMF and the World Bank, which Graeber describes as acting like gangsters, aren't viewed as outrageous or obscene, because their behavior is so bourgeois, so quantifiable, so technocratic. We accept technocratic institutions as moral, no matter how horrible they are. Technocratic institutions declare themselves the holders of debt, and other people must pay their debts. Their debt to the IMF, their debt to society, their debt to America for saving the world in the 1940s, etc. And since, surely, surely, what it means to have debt is to have to pay that debt, then the violence and exploitation that come with debt are the fault of the debtors, not the sober serious, sensible, highly educated class of bankers and consultants and financiers and administrators and lawyers who do the lending. And that brings us to the second moral confusion in this chapter. This moral confusion is summed up by someone who he's talking to at a party who says this oh-so-sensible phrase, surely one has to pay one's debts. This statement is the moral claim that underlines all of the justifications for American empire and indeed all of the justifications for just about everything in 21st century technocratic society. And it's not true. Here's Graeber. Actually, the remarkable thing about the statement, quote, one has to pay one's debts, is that even according to standard economic theory, it isn't true. A lender is supposed to accept a certain degree of risk. If all loans, no matter how idiotic, were still retrievable, if there were no bankruptcy laws, for instance, the results would be disastrous. What reason would lenders have not to make a stupid loan? It was that very apparent self-evidence, I realized, that made the statement so insidious. This was the kind of line that can make terrible things appear utterly bland and unremarkable. For almost two years, I had lived in the highlands of Madagascar. Shortly before I arrived, there had been an outbreak of malaria. It was a particularly virulent outbreak because malaria had been wiped out in highland Madagascar many years before, so that after a couple of generations, most people had lost their immunity. The problem was it took money to maintain the mosquito eradication program, 
since there had to be periodic tests to make sure mosquitoes weren't starting to breed again and spraying campaigns if it was discovered that they were. Not a lot of money. But owing to IMF-imposed austerity programs, the government had to cut the monitoring program. 10,000 people died. I met young mothers grieving for lost children. One might think that it would be hard to make a case that the loss of 10,000 human lives is really justified in order to ensure that Citibank wouldn't have to cut its losses on one irresponsible loan that wasn't particularly important to its balance sheet anyway. But here was a perfectly decent woman, uh, and I'm jumping in here, this is Graham, not Graber, he's talking to a lawyer who works for a, a charity. This is the woman who says the phrase, surely one has to pay their debts. Okay, back to Graber. Here was a perfectly decent woman, one who worked for a charitable organization no less, who took it as self-evident. After all, they owed the money. And surely one has to pay one's debts. Okay, that's the end of the quote. I think we've got the two moral confusions together now. On the one hand, the U.S. and NATO and the IMF are the good guys, just trying to uphold the moral order. On the other hand, the IMF murdered 10,000 people. Not with artillery, the way barbarians like Putin and Assad do, but with sensible, sober, serious, technocratic policies. And Graeber's argument that these two moral confusions are in some way the same one. We don't seem to be able to imagine a world in which debt shouldn't be quantified and moralized. And yet we don't seem to be able to imagine a world in which a certain quantity of debt should result in the death of 10,000 people in Madagascar. On the one hand, surely you should have to pay your debts. On the other hand, Debts should not be used as a way of organizing society. We believe both of these things. So we're confused. So you can think of the rest of debt, and therefore the rest of this podcast series, as a, a group of stories about how this system came to be and how this moral confusion grew out of a seemingly innocuous innovation like credit money. But before this episode ends, I need to highlight the last bit of moral confusion that runs through this chapter. This is the moral confusion when these two moral certainties slam together. That moral confusion is the fact that although many of us tend to instinctively assume that the people who have borrowed money are at fault, are bad people, and they deserve whatever happens to them, many of us, and I think often the same people, tend to instinctively assume that the people who have loaned the money are at fault, are bad people, and deserve whatever happens to them. To put this in terms of American politics, the same country created the anti-debtor Tea Party and the anti-lender Occupy Wall Street over the exact same economic crisis and with the same tone of moral indignation. And Graeber argues that this tension, this moral confusion, can be found in pretty much every culture in the world in pretty much every era of that culture's history. He tells a few of those stories. They're really great. I'm not going to read those stories. They'll be one of the highlights for you if you're reading along. But I will give you uh, how he introduces those stories. Also, I have to say, unfortunately, he uses the word usurer, U-S-U-R-E-R, -E like a million times <laughs> in this passage. And I never feel like I can say it right. You know, money lender. Here's Graeber. If one looks at the history of debt, then what one discovers, first of all, is profound moral confusion. Its most obvious manifestation is that most everywhere, one finds that the majority of human beings hold simultaneously that, one, paying back money one has borrowed is a simple matter of morality, and two, anyone in the habit of lending money is evil. Looking over world literature, it is almost impossible to find a single sympathetic representation of a money lender, or anyway a professional money lender, which means by definition one who charges interest. I'm not sure there's another profession maybe executioners, with such a consistently bad image. It's especially remarkable when one considers that unlike executioners, usurers often rank among the richest and most powerful people in their communities. Yet the very name usurer evokes images of loan sharks, blood money, pounds of flesh, the selling of souls, and behind them all the devil, often represented as himself a kind of usurer, an evil accountant with his books and ledgers, or alternately, as the figure looming just behind the usurer, biding his time until he can repossess the soul of a villain who, by his very occupation, has clearly made a compact with hell. I'll stop there, and you can read the stories yourself.
from a variety of cultures in which moneylenders are depicted as the vilest and most evil creatures. And Graeber also tells, although I admit with less gusto, a few stories in which money borrowers are vile and debased creatures. He can find both of those stories in a variety of cultures, because debt has been for the past 5,000 years just about everywhere, and because debt has also given rise to these incompatible and yet widely held reactions in so many places. This moral confusion is at the center of the concept of debt. And it has given rise to that other moral confusion. The fact that members of whatever you want to call it, the first world, the developed world, the Western world, feel like they're the good guys, even if they're bringing about the deaths of children. And so how we got from that ancient moral confusion to this oh-so-contemporary moral confusion is the story that I'll be sharing with you for the next year or so. We'll get to Friedrich Nietzsche's theory of morality, ancient Sumerian taxes, Adam Smith's plagiarism. I'll talk to economists, historians, archaeologists, and of course, science fiction authors. And when we're done, this series will be an introduction to the book debt, as well as a substitute for reading it. But I hope above all, it's an invitation to read it and to talk about it. Two last things. One, I'm going to end with some stuff from the very end of this chapter. But I also wanted to tell you, over the course of this year, I thought it might be fun to put together a YouTube live thing, some sort of thing where we can interact and talk. Maybe we can have an expert there. Maybe we can put together a mini virtual conference. I, I really don't know. If you are interested in this, let me know. I'd like to have some sense that people would actually like this and enjoy it before I try and put it together. Please email me at everydayanarchismpodcast at gmail.com if you're interested in some sort of venue or forum during this series where we can talk. As always, you can also reach me there if you just want to email me questions. And if you've got specific questions about the book, if you get them to me in time, I'll try and answer them in future episodes. Now let's end by going to the end of the chapter. Here's Graeber's preview of what's coming. This book is a history of debt then, but it also uses that history as a way to ask fundamental questions about what human beings and human society are or could be like. What we actually do owe each other and what it even means to ask that question. As a result, the book begins by attempting to puncture a series of myths, not only the myth of barter, which is taken up in the first chapter, but also rival myths about primordial debts to the gods or to the state that in one way or another form the basis of our common sense assumptions about the nature of economy and society. In that common sense view, the state and the market tower above everything else as diametrically opposed principles. Historical reality reveals, however, that they were born together and have always been intertwined. The one thing that all these misconceptions have in common, we will find, is that they tend to reduce all human relations to exchange, as if our ties to society, even to the cosmos itself, can be imagined in the same terms as a business deal. For a very long time, the intellectual consensus has been that we can no longer ask great questions. Increasingly, it's looking like we have no other choice. That's the end of the chapter. I would like to highlight before I move on to the end that this is something that Dirk Entz and I discussed in our discussion about modern monetary theory, how we've been told for at least a century that we can't ask the question of what money is and where it comes from. And in the spirit of Graeber, I've been doing this podcast to ask the questions about the things that we are supposed to take for granted. All right, this has been episode one of Everyday Anarchism's series on debt. I hope you stick around while we ask these questions and get Graeber's answers and the answers from a series of wonderful guests. Remember that I can use your support in the form of Apple or Spotify five-star ratings. You can go to everydayanarchism.com and pledge financial support, or, and this is my favorite, just tell a friend about the show. That matters a lot more than you might think. Okay, uh, sorry to break into the music here, but there was something that I messed up when I originally recorded this episode. I said that the lawyer who said to Graber, surely one has to pay their debts, was at a party. Okay, this was kind of true. I thought it was a party that happened to be 
in a garden. Silly me, I'm an American. It turns out it was at a garden party, which Graver was very clear that that interaction happened at a garden party. It just also turns out that I don't know what a garden party is. So when you listen to me talk about this chapter with Eleanor Yanaga in the next episode of this series, keep that in mind. It wasn't at a party. It was at a garden party. And Eleanor will explain what that means. Thank you.